Okay, so we get the fields, we got the method. So to get the URL, we just do F1, and then we'd say print that so we could see it. So let's do that. Um, and then we have the URL. And so let's run that and see what happens. So go install example. So now we had URL slash. So now we just got to save that into a variable. So we just go up here and say string, and then change that to an equal instead of a colon equal. Go down to here, you can just assign it to the body, place body, curl it. Now we get slash. So over here, same thing. Except now it shows whatever we put in there, so you know if I put two in there, it changes it. Uh, so it, it uh, shows us the URL. Pretty straightforward. Uh, I think everybody understood that. Um, the point is, we're essentially manually parsing HTTP and then manually building HTTP response files. So we're going to keep doing this for a little, just so I can cover more of HTTP things, uh, because some of these are going to be important for us. So the general format I described. There's other methods or verbs uh, that you can use. Get, post, put, delete, edit. Okay, so a post is the kind of thing that happens when you submit a form. And that form uh, is usually in the format called multi-part form data. So let's look at what that format looks like. Uh, let's describe here. So it's either this one or that one. This is the default one. For multi-part is for files. Uh, so this is all content type. And basically what you would see is uh, you'd be like the name equal and then it stuff's encoded. So maybe, maybe we should make a page and submit it just to see it. So <laughs> here's how we can do that. Instead of putting the URL body here, I can, of course, put HTML, right? And so, you know, we can have head and all that stuff. We're just writing regular old HTML. As part of that, I can make a form, right? And I can say method equal post. Um, I think it's method. I'm all confused now. Type equal text, and you give it a name. Uh, we'll just call it, we'll say, key. And give it a value. And then you have a submit button. And let's see what that does. I think it may not work. OK, so now if I go over here, I did work. So I submitted my form. Did it submit it? You have to say where you're submitting it to. Okay, so the stupid favorite cons. <laughs> uh, so it posted it, method post here. And so uh, so the method changed. Okay, everybody understand why? Yeah. And so because the method changed, the way it sends data is different. So in this case, there's a body associated with this that we didn't read. We just sort of discarded it. Why didn't we read the body? Because right here, I said if it's a blank line, then break. But that's true of a get, but for a post, there's body afterwards. So we need to parse that. And the way we can do that is uh, it sends the content length right here. Content length is eight. So we need to read eight more bytes. So let's do that. Um, so I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is make a headers map. So I'm going to say headers is a map of string string. And then I'm going to fill this map with the headers in here. OK? Uh, so if it's not a blank line, then we're doing headers. And I'm just going to do. Uh, strings.split and 
um, the line and colon and then space uh, and then two. And so this is going to be the so I expect F0 to be F0 to be the key or the name and F1 to be the value. So I'll just say equals F1. Okay, so now I have a map of all of the headers. So the content length will be content length and then the number. Um, okay, so after I break out, now I need to uh, parse body. Um, and so what we're going to do is, like we have the URL here, I'm going to have to save the method as well. And then save it here. So I'm going to say if method is, say, post or put um, then I know there's a body, so I need to parse the body. And how, how much of the body I need? I need uh, headers, content, length, bytes. And so I can convert that to an int. And then I'll call that a mount. Um, and then, so now we have how much of the body we should read. And so I can say, uh, on dot read. Well, let's use IOTIL or just IO dot read, and I'll show you this one. Read uh, at least, or maybe read full. Let's do read full. So I'll create a buffer, uh, slice it by, and I'll give it the length, so the amount. And I'm going to fill that guy with io.readfull. And what that does is, remember how I said when you read, it doesn't necessarily read the total, it just reads some part of it. Readfull will, will keep calling read until it fills it. Um, and so we'll read that. So it takes in the reader and then the buffer. So the reader is con, the buffer is buff. Um, and we're just going to skip the error. Of course, you shouldn't just skip the error for real, but this is what we're going to do for this. Um, and now we, in buff here, we will have the post content. So now we can see it by converting to a string and looking at it. So I'm going to put uh, body colon and then string and give it the buffer. Okay. So what we did here is we added, uh, so we saved the method off and then we added this so now we're keeping track of all the headers. We hit the blank line, we then try to parse the, the, the body. Okay. And we do that based on the content like past it. Uh, that's how we figure out how many bytes to, to get from the body. So let's see if we did this right. So now when I submit the form, now I see body in there. But notice the content type is set. Like I said, I haven't done this yet, so I'm making it up. Um, it did get to parsing body. Maybe we're parsing too much. Maybe we've already consumed a line or something. Uh, oh, that could be. So maybe I have to do this. The scanner has, we go to buff.io, scanner has like, I think it has a, it doesn't have the underlying buffer. Hmm. I think what's happening is it's like parsed too many bytes already, and so it's it's looking for them and it can't get them. Um, so what does it think the amount is? Let's try that. A 
behave. And see, I think it's stuck at this uh, the read full here, trying to fill it, but for some reason it can't fill it. Um, so what if I just think that maybe it got beaten with the scanner. We could uh, we could just keep going and see what this uh, the next line would be. Um, but, so but I guess it is getting down to uh, your what you printed out. I was just wondering if the break took you out and never hit 34 and 35, but but you're getting down to 43 because that was printed. Yeah. It's just not getting me the body for some reason. Um, like if I take this break out uh, and replace it with a continue or something. Uh, post this up on the scratch and then Daniel can play with it. <laughs> uh, what's going to happen now is that it's never going to uh, finish. I don't know why it's not letting me parse the body. Something screwy here. Um, I suppose because so it doesn't end the body. Figure out why this code's not working anymore. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's probably because I'm doing this with scanner and stuff, and I shouldn't really do that. Um, so, to rewrite it so it didn't use scanner, that's going to take a bit of work, and I don't really want to do that. So like, like I said, I think what's happening is scanner scan is trying to read a line and there is no new line in the content. Um, I don't know why wire shuts won't open. But if we were to see it, it's just the body. And so it's just the word test or it's gonna be like a uh, key equal test. And so I can show you it in here. And so it's like waiting to try and parse that final line, but it can't because it doesn't end with a new one. So that, that's why it doesn't work. Um, so we would have to use not scanner to do it, is what I'm trying to say, uh, which is a problem. So we're just going to skip this for now, and I'll show you the format in the net tab. So now we submitted a form. The request method changed to post, right? We, we still have our response here, but um, content length is eight, and then the data, if we view source, it's just key equal test, okay? So the format is form name equal form value. Now what happens if you submit with uh, a space in it, right? So I say test, test. Well, the format is percent encoded. So this is really hard to do with zoomed in. Uh, so it shows it in this format, it says just test, test. But if you say view source, you'll see it's got pluses between them. See that? So, um, like encode URI, the JavaScript function. It, it, uh, it takes the data and it codes it into this format. Okay. And so we could 
parse that body like that and get the data out and do stuff with it. Um, that's a chore to do, so we're not going to do it. But the point is, in Go, you could you know split on the equals and so on and so forth, uh, and, and parse out the body and do stuff with it. Okay, I just wanted to show you that that's how the body comes in. So it's uh, the, the request line, and then all the headers, and then a new line, and then this form data. And the form data is in this multi this uh, URL encoded format. This uh, the content type here describes the format of the data. Application XWW form URL code. Um, if you use a multi part, it's a slightly different format. But that's for if you have a file. A file input. Um, okay, so that we saw content type, right? The content type describes the type of the content, right? Uh, so we saw that for, for the request for a post, it described what it was. Uh, for the response, we should do the same thing. So let me show you another type of, uh, another content type we often use. Um, so I think it's just defaulting to HTML, but we can say content type, and then I can say plain text. Um, and let's see what happens when I do that. You don't need like body or data? Yeah, I do. Really? What did I do wrong? text slash plane. Text slash plane. Yeah, I did that. Um, what is the error? Oh, sorry. I thought you meant the other one. No, that one. Yeah. You were right. That yes. should not have been there. No, not at all. What the heck is wrong with this thing? There we go. So now it's in plain text encoding. And that means it's not HTML. So if I put characters in there, it will, you know, not interpret it as HTML. It's plain text. So we change the content type and the browser behaves differently, okay? Uh, and so we can use the content type to tell the browser how to interpret our data. Uh, but notice they're just bytes. They're always just bytes, okay? It's the interpretation of the bytes is dependent on the content type. So when you did your first post in your form, you had method equals post, and you could also do method equals get. The default will be get, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and that determined when you sent from the client to the server, Right, how the stuff got sent. But then on the server, you can determine how things get sent back. So tech, these are two different things. Those are the verbs. The text plain is the content type. Never mind. Yeah. Because I was just wondering, like, can people change the content type? No, that only happens on the server, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, you can change it for the post, the type of the data you send to it. We don't often do that. We do that if we have to have a file input, we change it. But if you want to do Ajax, you might change it. So you might send JSON instead of, uh, you know, form encoded. Oh, coming from the client back to the server, you'd say here's a different content. Yeah. So you've got these headers both on the request and the response. That's right. Okay. So. Uh, I got into print the uh, header stuff. Yeah. We put that to Slack. It's okay. We don't need to see it because it's not super important. You have to copy your code on Slack. I want to grab it. What was wrong with it? Uh, I, I said so it's scan each new line one at a time in a Go function instead because the connection stays open. Yeah. I said slack, I meant scratch. The, the way you should be doing this is sort of one byte at a time and then it would work properly. Uh, okay, so the other header, there's a bunch of other headers except we'll determine like uh, the kind of uh, content you're allowed to accept. 
Uh, we don't often use that guy too much. That connection. Uh, so there's keep alive versus close. So let's go look at that. Okay. So is that a single TCP connection to send and receive multiple HTTP requests and responses? So you open up a single HTTP uh, TCP connection. And now I can send a request to get a response. I can reuse that connection to send a request to get a response. And so we say connection keep alive, that's what that's saying. Now connection close means that as soon as the response is received, close the connection, that's it. Um, so the rules are, I think, this gets really uh, technical, but the idea is that if I use keep alive, I have to have a content link. Because otherwise it doesn't know when the response ends. Okay? And part of the error we were seeing was I was pushing too much data. And so it was like, I don't know what to do with that data. Um, because they only expected four bytes and I sent eight bytes or something. So you have to have the content link if you use keep alive. And you should be using keep alive by default because it's way more efficient. Uh, so, but sometimes you'll see connection close if, if you don't want to have to do that. If you don't, if for example, you don't know how big the data is ahead of time, then maybe you, sh you should use that. Uh, there's another thing called transfer encoding. And there's an alternative way you can send back data called chunked transfer encoding. I don't want to get too much into the weeds on that, but that would allow you to send data that you don't know the length of ahead of time. Okay. Uh, and, and basically, it breaks it up into pieces and then encodes those pieces separately and sends them along the way. And it's really complicated, but you can use that instead. Um, so it basically, you either have connection close and then send the body, or you have connection keep alive and set a content length and then the body, or you can use transfer encoding chunk. Okay, location we use for redirects. The idea is that you would return a different status code, the 301 we saw before, or 302, and then you'd have a location header telling us where to go. So let me show you that example again. I curled google.com, it returned it to 301, uh, and so let me show you the headers. Uh, so 301 status code, that's moved permanently, I think 302 is moved temporarily. Uh, moved permanently, and then the location tells you where to go. So what your browser is gonna do, it gets this status back, it looks for the location header, and sends you on its merit. So how could we redirect somebody in our code? Right, we just change this to a location header. Give it a new location. Change this 200 to a 302. I think it's 302. And now it should redirect us. Okay. So let's see what happens. Oh, I forgot to restart. We went to Google. Right. You see that? I did localhost 9000, and it took me to Google. Why did it do that? Because I had the location there with the 302 steps. So sometimes we use the location header to do that. Uh, range allows us, uh, when you're downloading, say, a large file, uh, if, the, if the server supports it, they, the user can pass in the range. So say I'm downloading a large file, I get disconnected, I reconnect, I'd like to resume the download. Your browser can pass along a range which will tell it how far it has downloaded. And so if, you're, if your server supports this, if you can read that range, that'd be great, because then you can give it just the data. In other words, you could have 95% done and resume that last 5%. Um, but that would be hard to implement. That would require a lot of work, but we could do it. Uh, this one's funny, refer. What's wrong with that? It's misspelled. Yeah. It's misspelled in the spec. So you have to use the misspelled word, because that's what it is in the spec, and that's what everybody uses. It's just funny that it's misspelled in the spec. So. And it's stuck that way. There's no way to change it now. Uh, this is not R E F U R E R. <laughs> that actually be better. Maybe it'll fix with HTTP with HTTP two. No, maybe I don't know. It's probably hopeless at this point. But uh, <laughs> the, the, you can use that to see where they came from. It's not reliable. You can't trust it, but maybe it's useful. Uh, and so it'll tell you the URL they came from when they clicked the link or whatever. That's the referrer. That's the idea. Um, but like I said, you can't trust it because anybody can change it or whatever. Uh, and then finally, the last header I want to talk about is this one. 
uh, www.authenticate, and that's how you do basic auth. So uh, I'll just show you the, if you need to do it, you can look it up, uh, basic, basic access authentication. Um, you basically put this guy, and then they have to respond with, and this will cause, when you go to a site that has the header, it'll cause a pop-up, and they can enter a username, password, hit OK, and it'll log them in. You've probably seen that on some sites before, but all it's doing is this adding these headers and stuff. Uh, the reason why you probably shouldn't be using this is um, this looks really secure. It is not secure. It's just a base 64 encoded plain string. So I can easily find out the value of this. Uh, so if I go to base 64 decode dot org, assuming that works, I paste it in and I hit decode. And now I have Aladdin Open Sesame. So not a secure way to store a password. Uh, <laughs> so if you use uh, HTTPS, then you can do this. Because that means that all traffic over that connection is secure. So HTTPS. If you use regular HTTP, do not do this. Because that means anybody can see your password. <clears throat> OK. But sometimes we use that. That's useful if you like want to lock down an admin section of the site or something. We might do that. Uh, but probably you should be using a form and then click submit. But you could use this basic HTTP thing if you want. <coughs> okay, uh, the final bit I want to talk about before we move on to the real HTTP package is caching. So caching on the web is really complicated. Um, you can spend weeks just trying to figure out all this stuff. This article is really good. I have linked, so it's definitely worth reading. Um, and he describes in detail the rules, and so he gives you these nice, you know, TLDRs to, to read and stuff. Uh, but the basic idea is that if you do not include the cache headers, if you don't tell it how to cache, it sort of follows its own default rules, and it will probably cache things for you. And that's probably not what you want. What that means is that if I go to a page and I have an image on that page, okay and your browser shows the image. If I go there tomorrow, it probably does not ask the server for that image again. It probably pulls it out, out of my browser's cache, okay? To improve performance, right? Uh, particularly when the web was created and getting an image was very expensive. Uh, it made sense to just pull it from the local computer. Um, the downside of that is, what if I change that image? So I changed it overnight. You come back to the site the next day. You see the old version of the image but I wanted to see the new one. That's a problem, right? And so we can use, be, by using headers, we can control what is and is not cached. Um, and so the basic rule is, well, I mean, you can follow these diagrams. It's kind of absurd. Uh, the basic rule is described right here. For pages, for HTML pages, always do no cache. And that means that the browser always gets a new version. Because a page is something that might change a lot. Okay, so just never cache a page. For styles and JavaScript, uh, what would be ideal is to store a cache of, this is one year in the future. So a really long cache copy. And then change the name of the file anytime you change it. And what this means is that if you don't change the file, the user comes back to your page, they get the old, old version, but you know it hasn't changed because the version hasn't changed. So they always get the latest version. But if they've already gotten it, you've just saved tons, they don't have to make a request for your server. And so you're reloading it just from there. And so that's why this is the, the best practice is to keep, put as part of the name of the file a version. And that way when you change the file, you, you guarantee they'll get a new version of JavaScript. Okay? And this, not doing this can just be brutal because for you it worked great. And then for one of your users it didn't work. They got the old JavaScript and the whole thing broke. And they're like, why doesn't this work? And they're like, well it works for me. And so to, to just, Alleviate that. Try to always set a long cache with a unique name, and you'll be good. Uh, if you can't set a unique name, so in this case, the photo.jpg, uh, the name here, the file can change without the name changing, right? Uh, then you can set a shorter cache time. This is like one day or something. Um, and that, that's a good strategy, too. Uh, the other thing you can use is what's called an e tag. And so one of the headers you can return. Uh, includes information, it's a, like a version number. And what will happen is their browser will ask for the file, you'll hand back an e-tag, 
And if they match, it doesn't actually have to return the whole file. It just returns, hey, you're good to go. You have the latest version. Um, so anyway, read that article for more. I just wanted to make you aware of caching and the nightmarish complexity of caching on the web. Because uh, that is something we have to deal with. Okay, so that's, uh, that's HTTP in a nutshell. Uh, maybe we'll take a five minute break and then we'll come back to real HTTP.